Hello, everyone, uh, dear friends, colleagues, guests from near and far. Um, welcome to today's event. Uh, I'm Vitaly Chernetsky, a director of the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, and a faculty member in the Slavic department here at the University of Kansas. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to uh, today's uh, talk, which will be happening uh, via Zoom in the format of a Zoom webinar. And we are really uh, grateful to KU's IT and media production studio and uh, John Rennert in particular for all the help uh, to us, uh, not only for this event, but over the years uh, for uh, making it possible to have our uh, weekly brown bag uh, lecture presentations are recorded. So um, even now in the middle of uh, the COVID-19 crisis, we uh, felt that it is very important to uh, reconnect and reconvene for the this event that we had planned long before the unexpected turn of events we had uh, on us this semester and uh, Welcome uh, today's uh, speaker, Professor Eve Levin, a longtime friend and associate of the center, an eminent uh, specialist in the field of uh, Russian history and also in the field of uh, women's history and uh, pre modern history of Europe. Um, and uh, of course, the long term editor of uh, the Russian Review, who brought the journal here to us uh, at the University of Kansas. I have my Russian Review t-shirt that I'm very proud to show here. I've had this review before, I mean, this t-shirt before I got to the University of Kansas myself. So this was, I think, a good omen of good things to come. And uh, so um, just a few words of uh, introduction. Uh, about uh, our speaker today. Um, uh, Professor Eve Levin has uh, joined uh, University of Kansas in uh, 2002. Uh, she has served as editor of the Russian Review since 1997. And before that, she was the associate editor for the journal. Here at KU, she's currently also the chair of the Department of History. Uh, she uh, received her BA from Mount Holyoke and both her MA and her PhD from Indiana. Uh, she taught at Ohio State uh, from 1983 to 2003, so correction, sorry, not two, but three, uh, when she joined uh, the University of Kansas. Eve, is that correct? That is correct. Uh, yes, yeah, so I don't want to mess up any dates. Uh, and as a scholar, I I've logged... Uh, Loved that unfortunately it's sitting in my office in Lawrence. Uh, uh, her wonderful book, uh, Sex and Society in the World of Orthodox Slavs, 19, sorry, 900 to 1700, published by Cornell University Press in 1989. And of course, we are also tremendously grateful to her for uh, her work editing and tra uh, translating and publishing uh, Natalia Pushkaryova's uh, fundamental uh, book, Women in Russian History, which was uh, published by Emmy Sharp uh, in 1997. She, the, the list of her wonderful accomplishments and the good work that she has done for the field is long, and I do not want to recite here things that you can find in print. The whole point of uh, today's gathering is that uh, Professor Levin, Eve, will share with us some of her thoughts and uh, musings about experiences of her uh, professional life as a uh, scholar of uh, Russian um, and Soviet history. Uh, the informal title that we prepared for uh, uh, today's uh, lecture and that uh, was in the announcement in the calendar is Living History. 
which of course can be interpreted uh, both ways, both as a history that is living and as living through history. And the subtitle was Memoir of a Cold War Survivor. Uh, we can of course uh, feel free to stick to it or depart in the ways that we see fit. And before I uh, pass uh, the uh, virtual floor and the virtual mic uh, over to Eve, uh, just a technical uh, note. Uh, we uh, will be uh, uh, doing the question and answer where, uh, via the Q&A uh, feature in Zoom. So if you look at the bottom of the screen, you will see that there is a Q&A option. And if you press that button, it will uh, let you type in the questions and the questions are being collected and um, at the end, I will serve as a moderator and uh, will uh, read out uh, questions uh, from you to Eve so that she would be able to answer them. And now please join me in welcoming Eve. Thank you, Vitaly. Uh, when I was asked to do this, uh, I was sort of uncertain whether I wanted to. This is going to be my last semester before my retirement. And I suppose that there is a tradition about doing these sorts of re personal retrospectives at this point in the career. It doesn't, I don't want to sound too much like I'm departing forever because I do intend in retirement to remain an active scholar and a, a, an associate as I hope an emerita professor at the University of Kansas and an affiliate of Crease. So I, I hope that this is not going to sound like I'm giving my own epitaph here, because that's not really my intention. I, I'm, I'm hoping to have a very, very long retirement so people will have many, many, many more years to get bored by anything I have to say. So when I was thinking about this, I thought about doing an autobiography. It seems that um, scholars of my generation, as they're coming to retirement, seem to be writing autobiographies, publishing them, and things like that. But I decided that I really don't want to do that myself, and um, I don't want to inflict it on the um, 30 or so people who seem to have joined us for today and the others who might stumble across this video unawares at some point in the future. And in terms of doing, let's say, an intellectual retrospective of my um, trajectory as a scholar, I'm not such a good extemporaneous speaker that I can actually tell you about my thoughts in a way that you would actually be interested in them or find them engaging. I recommend uh, that you just read my publications and you'll get a pretty good sense of how my thinking has evolved over the years and what my approaches are to the various intellectual problems that have taken up my professional attention. And I also don't want to give a, a retrospective on my personal life, how I became me, because I think of myself as a pretty boring person, actually. And I don't want to prove that by uh, demanding your attention for an hour. Although I suppose you all would be able to um, just click on that leave meeting button and then you nobody would be the wiser about whether you found this to be too boring. So what I'm not going to be doing is by talking about myself, um, I'm instead going to be talking about some of my experiences in navigating this changing world. Not, I hope, in a sort of a pseudo Forrest Gump manner in which I've had uh, brushes with major moments in history. I have, but I don't think that all that my role in them was at all important. But rather to talk about some of the things about how daily life has been experienced and how that's changed over time. That is, talking about my experiences as an ordinary person or maybe an ordinary academic and in, a, in the manner of a, the kind of oral histories that I like to read. That is, when people talk about the, how they live their lives, how they went about ordinary tasks, how they experienced the world around them. And since I'm now 66, I think that I can 
um, pretend that I'm old enough that people are actually going to be interested. I suspect that I, I know for sure that there are people who are here who are my age and even older, and some of what I'm going to say is going to sound all too familiar to you. So one of the things I'd like to talk about today are some of the outdated skills that I've acquired, because things have changed enough that there are things I learned to do and actually became proficient at that we don't need to do anymore, and I suspect we will never need to do again. Um, one of them was how to use a typewriter. And for um, college-bound students in my high school years, they recommended that we do we take a basic typing class, and it was with manual typewriter machines. Um, and there was a technique to using those typewriters that some of you who remember typewriters will remember, such as how awful it was when you made a typographical error. You couldn't just um, click the backspace and, uh, and erase it. You had to go back, get that bottle of white out, cover up the, uh, the little, the, the mistake, let the white out dry and until you, you could type over it. And of course, I was never patient enough, so I always typed over the white out while it was still wet, which just created a smudge, and then I had to do it over again. And sometimes I did that often enough that I actually had to take the page out, throw it out, and start over. So those were the sorts of techniques that we learned. Now, my first professional job actually was as a typist, particularly doing typing in Russian and English for the Slavic department at Amherst College. I was an undergraduate student then at Mount Holyoke. They hired me to, as a work study student to do this typing for them. And in the process of this, I learned how to navigate a Russian typewriter keyboard as well as a, an English typewriter keyboard. My job was primarily to produce classroom materials. And that too was a technological adventure which we no longer need to undertake. The technological adventure involved either typing dittos or typing stencils, which were two different sorts of technology, both starting with a typewriter. Um, you might remember if you've seen them in the archives, all those sheets of paper with sort of purplish faded ink on them. Um, I think we probably still have some in the in the crease archives someplace. But my job was actually to type out handouts for uh, classes and for department meetings on those stencils. Um, those stencils were actually even when I was doing this in the early 70s an old technology. Years later, when my dad retired and it was my job in the family, um, assigned by my mother, to clear out my dad's office, I found in his files not only uncorrect, um, corrected student papers that had never been returned to them, and at that point he had been retired for um, quite a lot of years, but there were still those papers. But I also found his ditto masters carefully preserved so that he would be able to run off more copies of certain exercises and quizzes for his students again. Um, I decided that we did not need to keep those ditto masters any longer. But those were the, those were the sorts of technologies we have. And it was not just a matter of using typewriters to prepare class materials. I still did my dissertation on a typewriter, although some of my or more enterprising colleagues in my generation already were using the computers of the day to do their dissertations. Um, it used to be for a dissertation that those graduate students who were more flush with money would hire a professional typist to do it. Those who were less flush would have their wife do it. Um, I didn't have a wife, so I had to do it myself. And I figured that I was going to be as good a typist as anybody I would hire. Having read quite a few dissertations in the process of doing the research on my own and having found huge numbers of typos 
in many of those dissertations, particularly in any words that were transliterated from Slavic languages. So that was a, a technology that I learned that I'm very happy to say I no longer have to keep up my skills in, and I have not had to impart those skills to the next generation of scholars. Or at this point, I guess it's two generations of scholars who are younger than me. Another outdated skill was keeping bibliography cards. Um, we used to write our bibliography on index cards and keep them, sort them into large or small file boxes where we use dividers to try to figure out what category they went into. This was based on the fact that we did not have databases to draw upon where we could just insert uh, some, some search terms and then have you know, a thousand different references to, uh, to um, published works pop up for us in a matter of seconds. Now, finding the bibliography was more of an adventure back in the old days. There was something that was um, coming out then gradually by volumes, the National Union Catalog. It was a new version and much expanded of the catalog of the Library of Congress. And new, ver new um, volumes appeared. Um, I can't remember whether there's months in between them, or but it was over the space of quite a number of years before the set was complete. And these volumes just had photographic reproductions of all the cards in the library card catalog at the Library of Congress. And of course, the, catalog, the card catalog was indexed not only by title of the book, but also, also by author and by subject headings. So these um, volumes actually allowed us to get hold of a lot of vocabulary, a uh, lot of bibliography. The problem, of course, was that um, each page of the volume had uh, a couple dozen of these cards on it. So you couldn't just Xerox a page and get what you wanted. So we copied these things down. There were other sorts of published indexes of, of journals. Russian Review actually had two cumulative indexes that had been published. And that was a time saver because I didn't actually have to go to the library, pull every volume of the Russian Review off the shelf, look at the table of contents and figure out what articles there might relate to my topic, repeat that with Slavic Review, repeat that with every journal we had, and try to find things that way. But given the amount of work there was that was involved in trying to uh, accumulate the bibliography of secondary pub works or even harder archival sources, we used to keep index cards. I kept those index cards until two years ago, moving them from one place to another, to another, to another. I took them to the Soviet Union with me in 1981 so I could do my research. I brought them home with me because I didn't dare to leave them behind. Um, I moved them to my first job. I moved them to my second job here at the University of Kansas. I moved them to a different office. Um, I kept these cards because so much work had gone into accumulating that bibliography. And finally, two years ago, when I moved my office the last time, I moved these boxes and I realized that I had not looked at anything in them literally for 20 years. And so with a tear and a sigh, I put them all into recycling and I haven't missed them. So that was what another outdated skill. A third outdated skill, and this, Vitali, I think you will probably remember. How do you manage a budget when you're in the old Soviet Union with its non-convertible currency? And you have money that's in rubles, and you have money that's in dollars, or other sorts of hard currency. How do you manage those different economies? And one of those skills involved trying to figure out what could be purchased for rubles because I had more rubles 
that I had dollars. I was on a Fulbright grant and I was getting a ruble stipend from our Soviet host that was con by Soviet standards fairly lavish, about not the amount a graduate student would get, but rather the amount that a professor would get. And, but I was getting a, only a very small stipend in dollars, $75 per month that had to cover everything that had to be paid for with dollars. So the question was how, what could I find for, for rubles? Well, in 1981-82, supplies were already getting sort of thin and unreliable on the Soviet market. And there were things that I absolutely couldn't find or items that I couldn't find that were to my taste, such things as toothpaste or shampoo. So I was buying that from the embassy PX. Well, at the American embassy at that time, the, um, the PX, the, the store that had American goods, was open only to diplomats. And those of us who were on officially recognized exchange programs, such as Fulbright or IREX, had, ex had access only to a limited selection in the PX. We had a separate room that was available to us that had virtually no food available because they knew that if the scholars who were living out among the Soviet population had access to the food, what we would do is buy it all up and then give it to our, our Soviet friends because they couldn't get hold of anything. And the result would be that the PX supply would be depleted and the diplomats would get mad. So instead we had access to those items that the embassy staff decided we needed to have access to, such as shampoo and toothpaste or over-the-counter over medications and, and things like that. And also things that happened to be in um, lavish supply, such as um, brake fluid for cars. Of course, none of us had any cars, but we could buy brake fluid if we wanted. So learning how to navigate that kind of economy was one of those skills that we learned. But when the ruble went convertible in the 1990s, we no longer needed to do that. And I don't see that kind of situation coming back again. So there were skills that I learned that I mastered that I actually don't need to have any more. But there are also some skills that surprisingly have come back and become necessary again. One of the things that I learned in the old Soviet Union was the necessity for stockpiling toilet paper. Because toilet paper was deficit, it was in deficit. There was never enough of it. Um, you never knew when you were going to find it. One of the things that Soviets did is whenever they found it, they would buy as much as they could carry. And there were even people who had ropes that they had long ropes and they would string the rolls of toilet paper on the rope and sort of carry this, these rope um, strands of toilet paper over their shoulders. And everybody who saw somebody carrying toilet paper that way would rush up to them and say, where did you find this? Well, it turns out that we need to do that too now, that we also need to stockpile toilet paper. Um, that we need to ask, where has it been found? And go there and buy up as much as we can carry away because otherwise we might not have it and we might be reduced to doing what Soviets used to do when toilet paper was deficit and they ran out, which is to use a copy of the Daily Pravda or some other similar sort of official publication for what they used to say was its real intended purpose. So that was something that was very good. Um, I have to say that because of my experiences in the old Soviet Union, I have been absolutely paranoid about having enough toilet paper. And when the, the um, stay at home orders came, it, I checked into my stock and discovered that I had toilet paper stashed in various um, cabinets and closets all over the house. 
So I actually have not run out yet, but the supply is getting low and I'm beginning to get really, really worried about it. So it's time to maybe go out, brave the stores and go on a hunt for toilet paper. Now, of course, there were other things that have to be stockpiled. It was not just toilet paper. One of the things that I, of course, will stockpile, and this will not be a surprise to anybody who knows me, is chocolate. Now, back in the old Soviet Union, I was able always to find chocolate, um, usually for rubles. Although even in 1981, the best chocolate was generally available only at foreign currency stores. And that's where I had to get it. Um, I hope that I have an adequate supply of chocolate. I watch it. I worry about it because this is the one thing other than toilet paper that I don't want to be without. Another skill that seems to, that has come back now is baking bread. Now, I know a lot of people actually bake their own bread all the time. Um, I have not been baking bread since I got my PhD. And the reason is not that I don't like to bake bread, but I simply have found that my days, even weekend days are so full that I don't have time. But when I was a graduate student, I did bake bread every week. And the reason I baked bread as a graduate student was twofold. One was that uh, my roommate and I were not able to afford good quality bread on our meager stipends as graduate students. And rather than eat the um, no name brand knockoff um, white plastic that poses as bread, uh, we decided that we were going to bake our own, even though actually the yeast and the flour cost us a little bit more than just buying this, this white bread. But the other reason was that when I was a graduate student at Indiana University in the later 1970s, the library was closed on Sunday mornings until noon or one o'clock, I can't remember which now, because the reason was that the students were all supposed to be going to church. So the library could not be kept open on Sunday mornings. Well, I was not a church goer and the result was I had a Sunday morning in which there was no possibility of going to the library. So this was a perfect time to bake bread. I baked bread every morning um, what, and, uh, to amuse myself while, while kneading the bread. I watched the Star Trek reruns, that's classic Star Trek, uh, on the television. This was, of course, network television with a TV antenna, and it got, we got rather bad uh, reception in our basement apartment. So that's baking bread. Well, it turns out now that we are advised to stay at home that baking bread is, is something I now need to do again. Um, in theory, it would be possible to buy bread and put it into the freezer and only have to go out rarely. But unfortunately, when I turned out, it turned out to be the case that my freezer doesn't work properly. So it's almost like I'm back in the old Soviet Union without a freezer and uh, having to manage with foods that can be kept fresh either on the shelf or in the tiny little refrigerator my roommate and I in Moscow had. Another, another useful skill. Back in the old days, we used to Kremlin watch. I was, of course, not a political scientist, but even so, we were all trying to figure out what was going on in the government of the Soviet Union by watching who appeared on the top of Lenin's tomb uh, during the various celebrations and who was in photographs of official occasions um, to try to figure out who was in and who was out. It seems to me that we're doing some of the same things during our president's afternoon briefings about the coronavirus. Who is standing next to him 
What does that tell us about who is who has his ear and who's going to be turned away and who's whose views are, are, are actually being taken seriously. When Dr. Burks was sitting by the side rather than standing up at the podium, what did that signify? Um, I think those of us who did our stint in Kremlin watching are actually well prepared to try to make sense of these sorts of signs of what's going on behind the scenes in the halls of power. And that's something else. One of the things that people who lived in the old Soviet Union, even as visitors learned to do, was to become very skeptical about official pronouncements. We assumed that anything that came out of the government was possibly had some truth to it, but was, pro was most certainly skewed in order to try to manipulate the views of the population. I think that that kind of skepticism that we learned then um, has served us well, particularly in more recent years, when we have to look at what we get from our government and wonder whether we are actually being told the truth. So those are old skills that I had that um, actually I didn't expect to continue to use but it turns out that I am. Since I'm a historian, I suppose I ought to talk about what the lessons of history are. Um, a lot of people like to talk about the lessons of history. The old adage is, of course, that what we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. So um, I have to start though with a caveat, something I tell my students. History is not a sentient being. History is not some sort of platonic ideal who's out there and who can, who can teach us something. It is we people who decide what lessons we want to learn from the past. And of course, there are lots of different lessons, sometimes contradictory lessons that people can take. Um, so it's what we see in, in history, not what history teaches us. So there are a couple of things that I'd like to explore today, and this is totally self-indulgent based on my own research. In the recent years, I've been working on uh, ideas of illness and healing, looking particularly at pre-modern Muscovy um, with you know, a few asides into, into Ukraine. Um, and one of the things that I've noticed was, of course, they had to deal with epidemics. This has been on my mind a lot in recent, in recent weeks as we've been coping with an epidemic ourselves. And one of the things that I have been studying is how people navigate understanding what causes illness what sorts of things, treatments they can get to heal their illnesses. Um, among other things, how do they pay for those treatments? And these are the sorts of questions that we're dealing with today. I mean, one of the interesting things is when there were outbreaks of the Black Death, one of the things that, um, according to both um, various pundits, various writings, and the words of experts, official government decrees, one of the things that would help to treat the Black Death was vinegar. So sure enough, with the coronavirus, one of the thing, treat, possible treatments that came out in the, um, over the internet early on was you should use vinegar. You should, um, you know, you should wipe surfaces with vinegar, you should garlic gold with vinegar, and uh, I thought, you know, some of these old treatments, they just come back. But of course, when um, our scientists started looking at the vinegar, they says, actually, that's not going to help with the coronavirus. Don't use it. I'm not sure that vinegar actually helped with bubonic plague either. I tend to think not. But it was interesting to see this very old remedy come back. 
another thing I saw, I've seen in my um, research on epidemics of the past was weird theories. Where does the epidemic come from? The Black Death um, in the first in the first onslaught, which reached Russia in 1352. Uh, coming actually from Western Europe. But the, but the um, theory at the time was that the plague had originated in India in a place called Sun City, is the way it's written in the Chronicle accounts. So there were all sorts of theories like that about the Black Death. One was that it was seasonal. And the theory about um, the Black Death was that it's seasonal and it would actually occur primarily in the summer and the fall, in the early fall, that is during the warmer months and not during the colder months, sort of the opposite of the theory about um, COVID-19. Well, I actually started looking at those, that theory because quite a few historians of the Black Death who work on primarily on places in Western Europe, particularly um, the Mediterranean areas, have actually said, well, this is a seasonal plague. This is what people actually experienced. And it experienced that it was worse in the summers and the fall. So I actually went through the Russian um, uh, records of out outbreaks of the plague to find out what seasons they occurred in and discovered that in fact in Russia, the plague could occur during the summer or fall, but the plague could also occur during the winter and the spring and last through the summer and still be there in the fall. So obviously the seasonality, at least in Russia, was not, was not what was said. And since we're pretty sure that it was in fact exactly the same illness, the whole theory of seasonality needed to go away. Another aspect of my study for the plague is it has proven to be um, appropriate to consider at this time, and that is the officials' reactions to it. There was a pattern to how the, the governments reacted to the plagues in the past, um, and they followed a general pattern. The first reaction, of course, was to say, we have no plague here, no disease at all. Yes, there may be some plague someplace else far away, not here, not among us. We don't have to worry about it. It's not going to affect us. We have no plague. That was the first stage. Then there would be a statement saying, well, there is the plague, but it's only some outsiders who brought it in and we've got it, you know, it was just them, not us. We can't have the plague here, wouldn't happen. We, you know, we're just gonna, you know, prevent people who are infected from coming in and we don't have to do anything else because closing down anything would be really bad for business. And if we had the plague here, the people might not come and that would hurt the economy and we're not gonna have any plague here. Next stage. Um, there might be a few cases, but it's only among those really poor people who have bad hygiene, who, you know, live over there in those parts of the town that we don't go into anyway. And it's not very many and it is contained. They're not going anywhere where we've got it all locked down. No plague. Don't worry. You don't have to do anything. Then the rumors start that the number of deaths has been vastly underreported. The people, when it says that people are di had died of, it wasn't really that it was announced that they hadn't died of the plague, but probably they had. And the government officials have to start dealing with the rumors and they say, well, no, we've got good counts and no, we don't have, we don't have the plague. There are only a few cases. It's not something to worry about. Next stage. Time to have a, a national day of prayer. Because now what we have to do is we, we see that there's something of a problem and we need God's help on this. Um, followed by some quarantines. Um, the state, and we've had all of that happen now. And what the next 
the next thing I would expect will be that our government officials are going to retreat to their villas outside of the Capitol and pull up there and allow the plague to, the plague to rage every place else. I'm just waiting for that to happen if the patterns today follow the patterns in the past. Now, I've read a lot about quarantines and how they were done, and these are in some ways surprisingly familiar. The quarantines as they were done in Muscovy involved not only restricting travel, but also telling people that they, who were in a plague aff afflicted area, that they had to stay there, that they were not allowed out, and other people were not also not allowed in. And the people who were healthy within these streets of towns or villages were responsible for taking care of the sick. Now, one, this made the, the Muscovite experience a little bit different than Western Europe because in Muscovy, in Western Europe, they, after the first onslaught of the Black Death, they set up um, play hospitals or, or la called lazaretti in order that the victims of plagues, their families or their neighbors could bring those people there and thus not be quarantined. They didn't do that in Muscovy. Um, they did not set up hospitals for plague victims. Um, the government did not, although it had a, a, a chancellery that dealt with health care and employed foreign phys physicians and imported medicines, they actually did not provide any of those official medical services to plague victims because they knew that the plague was deadly. They knew that it was going to spread. They knew that the demands would be great and they didn't want to risk lose, wasting all of this on the ordinary population. But there, they, did, they did engage in quarantines and this turned out to be problematical in many sorts of ways because who was going to guard the quarantines? The um, foot soldiers who were drafted to do this didn't want to be in the plague area. They tended to run off and then of course some of them got sick but then there were other examples. Um, for example, one quarantine zone at Kursk, I think this was about 1690, the um, guards got bored with their guard duty and decided to go into the quarantine zone to taverns where they would be able, where they got drunk and disorderly. So maintaining the quarantines turned out to be a real problem. Another way of trying to deal with the plague that was a little bit different in Muscovy was that in Muscovy, they decided not to believe when anybody said claimed to be healthy, even if they had some sort of doctor's certificate to say so. In Western Europe, people who were trying to come out of a plague zone could have a certificate of health and present that at the quarantine checkpoints and be allowed to leave. Um, of course, in those places, um, doctors could be paid to provide such certificates, such certificates could be forged and things like that. In Muscovy, the order that came from the Tsar in Moscow was, if anybody claims that they're healthy, don't believe them. Don't let them pass. Um, not, you know, not even if they say they're healthy, not even if they have documentation, don't let them pass. So as we're talking about the possible creation of health passes in the COVID-19 crisis, I'm reminded that those passes are not necessarily guarantees that these people are healthy and how the Muscovites back in the 17th century already knew that. But I think overall the lesson about, that I draw from the epidemics of the past that I've studied is that they too pass with time. For a while they become part of life, but eventually they cease, just like the Black Death has mostly ceased to be a problem in the modern world. And so with time, COVID-19 or its offshoots, I'm hoping are going to cease to be a problem. Another lesson that I've learned from history is 
how religion is resilient. When I did my graduate studies in the, in the late 1970s, I was taught by my professors that religion was not something I needed to learn a whole lot about. It never had really been important, except as a superstructure, um, a way of voicing political and economic um, and social goals. It didn't matter. And it certainly didn't matter in the Soviet Union. Um, I think that was because of where I went to graduate study. If I had been a graduate student at the University of Kansas in that time, I think William Fletcher would have convinced me of the importance of religion, even in the Soviet period and its importance in Russian history. I remember when William Fletcher gave a guest lecture when I was a graduate student and planted the seeds, I think, not only of my interest in religion as a field of study, but perhaps also my interest in coming to the University of Kansas, ultimately. But I, one of the things that I've learned in my study of religion is that the institutional history of religious organizations, such as the Russian Orthodox Church, and the intellectual debates of theologians and scholars about what orthodoxy means is not the whole story. That in fact, what ordinary people think about what is the supernatural in their life, what gives their lives meaning, what kinds of rituals uh, mark their time, their passages from one stage of life to another, from one time of the year to another. And these lived experiences that ordinary people have may be quite different than what the, the institutional church teaches or what the theologians tell them they ought to think and what they ought to do. But these lived experiences, their own understandings, are as valid and as complex and as interesting as anything that church leaders could formulate for themselves. Another thing that I've learned through my studies is how easily religious traditions can be invented. That it doesn't take very long for a, a ritual or for a stance on a particular issue to become so old that Nobody remembers how old it actually is or when it actually started. And they assume that it goes all the way back to the earliest founders of, of that religious order. That is to Jesus Christ, um, his apostles, and the church fathers in the case of orthodoxy. But in fact, very often, things that are described as traditional aren't traditional at all. My first book, as Vitali pointed out in the, his kind introduction, was about medieval Slavic sex. This, of course, was a new topic at that time. There wasn't so much as a single published article on this subject. Uh, when I published my book, it gained me a certain amount of notoriety, um, especially, I, as I recall, um, in Bulgaria. Uh, where they decided it was, of course, it had to be an American who was going to write a book about sex. But in any case, I wrote the book about sex, and it's still in print. You can still buy a copy if you choose. I even get royalties on it. Well, not very often, but occasionally. So the book is still there, and I think it's still a, a valid work, although, of course, there are quite a few things in it that I would change if I were to do that book again, which I'm not going to do. But one of the things that, I've, that my study of sex um, has taught me is that what people say is the teachings of the Russian Orthodox Church today are not at all what the teachings actually were in times in the past. And in fact, the so-called traditional Russian Orthodox positions espoused by the high clergy of the Russian Orthodox Church at this time, with a particular animosity toward LGBTQ people and um, promoting um, childbearing and things like that, are actually not the traditions of the Russian Orthodox Church 
if you look back at the period I was looking at, which was before 1700, in that period, the Russian Orthodox Church did not regard uh, same-sex interactions as worse than heterosexual interactions. And in many cases, they regarded them as considerably less serious than um, the wrong kinds of heterosexual interactions, such as um, a man and wife sleeping together before church on Sunday, or one of the worst sins, having sex with the woman on top. So those kinds of teachings, which have, of course, disappeared entirely from the Russian Orthodox Church's um, public statements today, um, were um, actually what the norms were in the past. The norms that the Russian Orthodox Church is promoting today actually have a different origin, which is very obvious to those of us who've studied the history of religion, religious teachings on sexuality. And the Russian Orthodox Church today has taken its model of sexuality from American evangelicals. I don't think that they would be prepared to admit that, but that happens to be the truth. A couple final words of wisdom, which I'm going to indulge in just because this is the um, seminar, which is in honor of my retirement. One is that although nobody has a monopoly on the truth, and usually what we take to be the truth is incomplete and not absolute, the same cannot be said about things that are false. Falsehoods can be complete and absolutely untrue. And we all uh, need to keep in mind that just because there are perspectives on every, about everything and we need to be aware of our perspectives, we need to be aware of our presuppositions. Sometimes there are actual realities that we need to remember exist, that everything is not a postmodern universe where everything is relative everything is a matter of perspective. There are physical realities. And in our society today, we are facing one of those physical realities, the reality of the coronavirus. And it doesn't care what our perspectives are. Um, it doesn't care what biases or presuppositions we have about it. It is a reality that cannot be argued or reasoned away. And I think that that is the lesson which is mostly most on my mind in these troubled days that we have today. So I think that um, it's time for me now, Vitali, to handle some questions. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Eve, uh, for uh, sharing uh, both uh, your memories and uh, uh, words of wisdom. Uh, it is wonderful, of course, to uh, uh, think back uh, about many of the exciting uh, things and indeed skills that we acquired back then that are no longer necessary now and skills that are enduring. Um, of course, I experienced the 80s on the different side of things, so I did not have access to dollars, but what I did have access to was uh, foreign visitors who were visiting our uh, high school and uh, so had uh, hard won access to big pens or chewing gum or some other things that they would leave us as uh, uh, mementos. Uh, but yes, you know, card catalogs and developing those is uh, certainly another skill that it's sometimes difficult to um, uh, engage with uh, and explain to uh, students of the younger generation. Uh, so uh, we still have uh, uh, our number of audience members has declined slightly, but we have 31 persons here, uh, but I do not see open questions just yet. So I encourage our guests to pose questions. And uh, in the Interest of, uh, you know, while we're waiting for those questions, since you brought up bread baking, uh, do, 
in your bread baking, in the return to bread baking now, did you try to incorporate some of the breads you learned in uh, your time in the Soviet Union or is it a more um, Americana style of breads? Well, I have to say, I have been trying to reproduce the Russian black bread. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but it never tastes the same as that Russian black bread, particularly I, I'm thinking of the bread I got in the 1980s, which I'm sure Vitaly, you remember. At that point, it seemed at most bakeries, there was white and there was when there was black and those were mm -hmm. your two choices. And there didn't seem to be, there might, you know, there were in theory other varieties of bread, but that was what you got. Well, that, what they called black bread was really sort of, really sort of a medium brown, mm -hmm. if you might remember. And, I have never been able to reproduce the taste and the texture of that bread. Uh, yes, there are, I mean, it's like those, you know, Proustian memories of a particular taste and smell. And um, I would say that probably, you know, I'm not a food historian <laughs> or food specialist, but there was something, the combination of yeast and probably something like sourdough starter because it does, did have a bit of a sour taste. But who knows? We have the question now from Nathan Wood. Uh, Nathan says, thanks for your presentation, Eve. Do you think that uh, you now write uh, compose text differently with a word process on a computer than back in the typewriter days? Well, I, I certainly do. Um, I was a good enough typist that I could compose at the typewriter. But I have to say that with a word processor, I can be much more meticulous about my writing because there isn't the huge amount of investment in time in doing revisions. In the old days, every, uh, you, you could correct small errors, but if you wanted to correct something that was larger, you ended up having to literally cut and paste. You take a pair of scissors, you cut the text you wanted to keep, um, away and throw out the, pe the, the text you didn't and then paste it with rubber cement onto another piece of paper. But of course you couldn't actually turn it in in that form. And you, what you'd have to do is, you know, write all over it, type, eventually type up a new version uh, when, even, when even I couldn't make sense of my scribblings anymore. But ultimately I ended up being content with text that was imperfect, wordings that were not so good. I would find typos that I would try to have to correct by hand um, and organizational things that I really didn't like, but I had to go with them because the idea of typing up a whole new um, article or a whole new paper, a whole new chapter that was that would be an investment in time. It would take me usually to do, a, a, let's say, a 20, 25 page double spaced um, chapter or, or, or paper or, or article would take me a whole long day sitting at the typewriter. So I learned to live with a lot much higher level of imperfection than I've got than I have now. The other thing was, of course, the dreaded fear that you would lose your footnotes. Because if you actually put your footnotes down at the bottom of the page while you were um, composing on a typewriter, when you did the cut and paste, you could lose those footnotes. And that was what we all feared, that we were going to lose our footnotes and we were no longer be going to be able to substantiate what we were writing. Um, Certainly, the, having word processing programs that automatically move the footnotes with the text and renumber it for you is really a wonderful thing that has really helped me in terms of making my scholarship much more accurate. All right, we have a question from Eric Scott and we have a comment from Joshua Lawler. So Eric, uh, says that he has been, uh, sees that uh, he and Nathan were thinking along the same lines and he is asking, uh, just to summarize, uh, 
how the technological changes have they, I mean, obviously helped uh, as an easy access to the database searches or digitized documents, but also how they could have hindered, for example, screens bringing endless distractions, shorter attention spans, a shift from uh, physical journals to online databases. What is the impact of this for the historical profession? Well, that's a huge question. Um, I don't think I want to take up too much time with it. But certainly one of the things that we have is as a result uh, of all the access is we can be absolutely overwhelmed with material to read. And there's a temptation then to continue to read and read and read and read because there's always more that you can find. You can always follow up um, through the subject headings from one article to get to another, to try a search in a different way, produce new, um, new items that are worth looking at. And if scholars had already had a preference to read rather than to write, that was of course the legend about graduate students in my day, we would always prefer to read another book than actually have to sit down and write those, that page of the dissertation that day. Uh, I think that that's manifested too. The other thing is, particularly the way we read journals has changed a lot. Now we think of journals basically as just repositories for separate articles, and we're likely to run into only the articles that we happen to be looking for, either to, for the purposes of our research or the, for the purposes immediately of our teaching to prepare a particular lesson. But back in the old days, when journals came on paper and they arrived, we hoped, on schedule every quarter, we would actually look through the whole issue to see what, there, to see what was there. And we might end up having our attention caught by something which wasn't of immediate interest to us, either for our teaching or for our research, but turned out to be inspiring in some ways in terms of thinking in new and different directions and enhancing knowledge about areas that weren't of immediate concern, but would come back to mind when we, they became areas of immediate concern. And I think we don't do that as much anymore. Uh, let me read Joshua's comment, which I found very moving. Uh, this is more a comment of appreciation than a question. One of my dearest experiences at KU was sharing an office in Smith Hall with you, Eve, during a semester a number of years ago. Sitting next to a historian of your quality, erudition, creativity, and sense of humor was wonderful for me. And I uh, refer to your comments on the process of your work. Uh, which was folk healing methods in Russian monasteries, I recall, and especially what it means to be a historian. That is, what story do I want to tell about this often? This is what Joshua says. And uh, uh, we have uh, uh, a question that just came in, and given that we are out of time, it probably uh, will have to be the last one. Uh, the question is from Andrew Jones. Eve, do you have any highlights uh, that uh, you'd like to uh, repeat from uh, the time in the Soviet Union, specifically the takeaways from your Fulbright? Well, I think that probably the most important thing that happened to me that year was making contact with the uh, Russian scholar Natalia Pushkaryova. We were introduced to each other um, very early in my stay. I'd been, I, I think I'd been in the Soviet Union for less than a week when I met her. We had the same advisor in the history faculty at Moscow State University that was Valentin Leverentich Yanin, who passed away just very recently. Um, and he, was the kind of broad-minded and generous scholar who was willing to take on both Natalia Pushkaryova and me, who had an interest in studying the history of women, which was in the Soviet period, not considered to be a valid topic because women did not constitute a social class 
and all history had to be written on the basis of social classes. But um, Valentin Lavrentic was very kind and very generous. He not only took on both Natalia Pushkoryova and me, but he also um, treated me, an American, from the, from the country of Ronald Reagan, they called the Soviet Union the evil empire. He treated me as though I was just another one of his graduate students, but a foreigner and maybe uh, needing particular care and attention and solicitude. And that's how he treated me. So matching me up with Natalia Pushkaryova was part of his way of taking care of me to make sure that I would have a native guide. And of course, he took care of her by say, telling her that she was supposed to take care of me, which meant that he was protecting her when she was associating with this American, that she couldn't be in trouble because her advisor, a uh, corresponding member of the Academy of Sciences, professor, doctor, Valentin Lavrentijian, and had told her to take care of me. The relationship I've had with Natalia Pushkodyova over the years, the way she has helped me to become a better historian, has helped me to understand Russian culture and society so much better. The way she's been a friend, her family have been friends to me for all these years. That was an, the kind of experience that I had because I went on a Fulbright in person that I never would have had otherwise and it transformed my life. It was Natalia Pushkaryova who suggested to me that I write a book about medieval Slavic sex, because she said, this can never be published in the Soviet Union. Well, by the time my book was published in 1989, things had changed. And in fact, things could be published in the Soviet Union at that point. But that kind of relationship is the sort of thing that I think that Fulbrights are really all about. And that's my takeaway from it. Wonderful. On this happy note, please join me, dear audience members, in uh, virtually applauding Eve. I'm applauding by myself in my room. Uh, we have a note of thank you from Nathan. What a stirring testimonial to the Fulbright program and to academic friendship. Thank you, Eve. And uh, so thank you everyone for your attention. Thank you, Eve, uh, for uh, uh, speaking to us and uh, we will have to wrap up now and I uh, hope that we will have more good events like this in the future and of course this lecture, this uh, presentation has been recorded and will be available uh, on uh, the CREES YouTube website uh, shortly. Thank you so much everyone. This concludes today's event. Bye-bye.